Well, we've been uh, talking this year about uh, the coming of the kingdom. And if there's one thing we know about the kingdom, it's that the kingdom is near. We know this because Jesus said it and said it repeatedly. The kingdom of God has come near to you. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Now, when some people hear that the kingdom is near, they want to know exactly how near it is. Their main interest is in the timing of the kingdom. So, for example, one cartoon depicts two men on a sidewalk holding up signs announcing the coming of the kingdom. One, one of the sign reads, the end is near. The other one reads, the end is Thursday. The man with the more open-ended sign looks at his colleague and thinks to himself, amateur because he's tied his prediction to a particular day of the week, uh, whereas uh, the man himself is leaving it open-ended. It could come at any time. This is the kind of speculation that we have in our world today. But the truth is that Jesus made it perfectly clear, no one knows when the kingdom will come. So why speculate? Besides, when it comes to the kingdom, there is a much more important question for us to consider than its timing. And that question is whether we even want the kingdom to come. This morning in our worship, we said that we did. Everything I have for your kingdom's cause. And yet the truth is that often we are tempted to seek an alternative dominion. And the reason for this is very simple. We would rather rule our own lives than submit to the sovereignty of God. To accept Christ as king is to acknowledge his authority over every aspect of life. That's what a king is. It's someone who rules. And so if Christ is king, then he has a right to rule over everything we are and everything we have. Our course list, our career plans, our wardrobe, our cell phone, our free time, our friend group. There, there's not one aspect of life where we can say, this is for me, God, and not for you. And so as we consider the kingdom of Christ, the issue for us, I think, is not so much when the kingdom will come, but whether we want it to come at all. One way to illustrate the choice we have to make about this is to consider a verse from the Old Testament let me invite you to turn to the first chapter of 1 Kings. It's one of the Bible's, I think, most brutally honest verses. And I come to it from time to time because it confronts me with the choice I make in my own life. It's a verse from 1 Kings from the story of Solomon. You may remember God had anointed him to be king after David. And what happened was this. It was in the days when David was too old to keep warm in bed. And in those days, his oldest son, Adonijah, had decided that he wanted to be the next king. Adonijah knew that God had chosen his younger brother Solomon, but rather than submitting to God, he wanted his own kingdom. And notice what is said here in verse 5. Now Adonijah, the son of Haggith, had exalted himself, saying, I will be king. Not only that, but he also prepared for himself chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. The incident reminds me a little bit of what happens in a game of checkers when one of the ordinary playing pieces suddenly becomes royalty. It moves and jumps across the board, reaches the other side, and suddenly one of the players commands, king me. And a second checker is stacked on top of the first one, and now that newly crowned king is the power to move all over the board. That's really what Adonijah was doing when he exalted himself over Israel. King me, he said. Not even waiting for his father to die, he wanted to take by force something that was only God's to give. He wouldn't submit to God's kingdom. He wanted his own kingdom, his own power, his own glory. His attitude really is captured, I think, in uh, the title for today's chapel message, Mine is the Kingdom. I wonder, have you ever felt the same temptation to take what you want when you want it instead of waiting for if and when God wants to give it to you? One way or another, we are all tempted 
to exalt ourselves. And when we do that, we are on the throne. God is no longer our king. He has simply become one of our servants. And so instead of seeking his kingdom, we expect him to seek ours. And know this, if you put yourself on that throne, sooner or later you will get upset with God for not doing whatever you expect him to do. This is helpful to remember whenever you are angry at the world or angry at others or angry at God himself, it is almost always because we have the wrong person on the throne. I think it's instructive to notice how Adonijah exalted himself. The scripture talks about him gathering these horses and chariots. He had a charioteer to drive each chariot and then 50 men in addition to, in, in addition to that to run ahead of him. If you want people to know how important you are, it helps to have your own entourage, and that way, even before you arrive, people have the sense that someone important is on the way. I'm reminded in this scene of something I witnessed in high school. It was freshman year, and our class had organized an auction to raise uh, funds for the class, and uh, various freshmen sold themselves to upperclassmen to be slaves for a day. Now, one. Uh, one enterprising sophomore put down chump change to get uh, to purchase the services of a couple of uh, reasonably muscular freshman football players, and then he had to pay top dollar for some of the prettiest girls in the class. And the next day, he made a very dramatic entrance to our French class. The, uh, the guys were burying him on a litter while the girls fed him grapes one by one <laughs> and uh, fanned him with palm fronds. He was some kind of teenage pharaoh, I guess. <laughs> Image is everything. If you're going to be the king, you have to act like the king, and that includes having people to treat you like the king. And so Adonijah paid his posse, and then he made sure that he had the support of some of Israel's most powerful leaders, the head of the military, one of the leading priests. And then notice this in verse 9, his public display of personal wealth and religious commitment. Adonijah sacrificed sheep, oxen, and fattened cattle by the servant's serpent stone, which is beside Enrogel. And he invited all his brothers, the king's sons, and all the royal officials of Judah. And strikingly, in verse 10, he didn't invite people he knew would disagree with him. Basically, he was hosting his own coronation. He was getting the right people on his side, killing the fatted calf, throwing a huge party, making animal sacrifices to show how religious he supposedly was, and yet it was all for himself. And very ironically, his name means God is master. And yet it's clear from everything here that here is a man who wants to be his own master and so never submits to the kingdom of God. We are tempted to crown ourselves the same way, to impress people with what we have or who we know or how much we are doing for God. Now, we like to have people around who will uh, tell us what we want to hear. They'll reinforce our attitudes, affirm our choices, support our ambi ambitions without ever challenging our perspective or correcting our sins. Now, maybe we don't ride a chariot or hire 50 servants or invite celebrities over for dinner, but we find other ways to crown ourselves. We uh, make sure people know our test scores or we show off our latest purchases or we do whatever it is that people in our community do to keep score. Maybe we simply do it by complaining about our workload, giving ourselves a sense of self-importance. They all can be ways of saying, mine is the kingdom. Like Adonijah, we try to give people the impression that we are something more than we really are. Now, I think we know as followers of Christ that we are called to seek a different kingdom. But before talking a little bit about how to do that, I want to mention some of the kingdoms that I think we are tempted to seek instead. I think the better we understand those temptations, the more consistently we will be able to live for the kingdom of Christ. Let me mention some of the other kingdoms we seek. Many of us are tempted to seek the kingdom of success. What really makes us feel good is being recognized for our achievements. And so we can't 
really be happy unless we get the grade we think we deserve or give the performance that we expect to give or win the game that we counted on winning. And maybe we thought we were doing all of that for the glory of God, but when we failed to live up to that standard, we quickly discovered that what we really worshiped was success. I wonder, have you learned how to be second best or even third best at something for the glory of God, if that's the best that you can do? Or does it kill you to know that someone else is better? Most of us are also tempted to seek what Mark Buchanan calls the kingdom of stuff. We live in a culture that believes there is always something we can buy to make us happy. Just look at the way advertising sells happiness for the price of a new pair of sneakers. Or better yet, think about all of that stuff that you brought to college this fall, or all of the stuff that you will end up dumping or storing or leaving behind at the end of the school year. Truly, most of us have more belongings in our bedrooms than the average third world family has in its entire home, if they have one, which some people don't. I'm not saying that it is wrong to own property any more than I'm saying it's wrong to succeed at things, but I am saying that it is tempting to worship the things that we can buy. We give them our time, our attention, we pay them our money, we use them to establish our identity. That's all really a way of saying that we worship them. And when we do, we are seeking the wrong kingdom. Then there is the kingdom of sex. This too is something we are tempted to worship. Most people in our culture, whether they are gay or straight, claim the right to use their own bodies any way they please. If it feels good, do it. And thus they are offended by the idea that anyone else has the right to tell them how they should or shouldn't use their sexual parts, even God Almighty. There was a good example just a couple of weeks ago from the television host Piers Morgan. And he was making this point in an interview. He said, when it comes to sex, we need to move with the times and we need to drag the Bible, he said, kicking and screaming into the modern world. I think what he really wanted to say is that sex is sovereign, not God. These are some of the kingdoms we seek, sex, stuff, success. Let me add another one to the list. It may be the biggest kingdom of all, the kingdom of self. Because what really keeps us from saying, thine is the kingdom, is our stubborn insistence on saying, mine is the kingdom. Given the choice, we want to enjoy our own pleasures, choose our own entertainments, control our own schedules, and determine our own destinies. A couple of years ago, in a whimsical moment, I took the classic hymn, Have Thine Own Way, Lord, and wrote a paraphrase that went like this, have mine own way, Lord, have mine own way. Let me be in charge here, at least for today. I really don't need you, say what you will. I've got my own plan, Lord, you can just chill. Now, most of us wouldn't have put it that bluntly, but that is the way we often operate as if we are on the throne and God should be serving us. It's because we are so in love with ourselves. At a recent floor fellowship, I was asked about my biggest regret from my college days here as a student. You know, was there some uh, summer program? I always wish that I had gone on some other activity, something I wish that I had done. I, I said in retrospect, the main thing I always regret is that I love myself too much to really love other people the way that Jesus loves. And see, that's what happens to us when we are caught up in the kingdom of self. There is a different kingdom that God wants us to seek, the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. Rather than crowning ourselves, Jesus invites us to submit to his sovereign rule, to swear allegiance to his kingship, to surrender everything to him, putting his kingdom first. And in giving us this invitation, Jesus also gives us a wonderful promise. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then what? 
then all of these things will be added to you. This is what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. And when he talked about these things, he was talking about all of the things that his disciples were worried about, food, clothing, the necessities of daily life. And Jesus said, if we really pursue his kingdom, God will add to us everything that we truly need. And I think when we do seek the kingdom, we find that all of the attitudes that are caught up in all of those other kingdoms find their right place in life. Each of those areas of life gets totally transformed when we surrender it to the kingship of Christ. Let me just give you a, a few thoughts about that to help us get started thinking. Let's start with success. What happens when we surrender that idol to the kingship of Christ? The main thing that ought to happen is this. We no longer base our sense of identity on what we achieve or fail to achieve. But we find our identity in the fact that we have a king who loves us and gave himself for us. It's something no other religion can claim. We have a loving savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who lived for us, died for us, and rose again for us. And so we no longer live to gain anything for ourselves. Everything has been given to us. The kingdom has been given to us. And so now for us, success simply means being faithful faithful to use our gifts to the best of our ability for Christ and for his kingdom. And then let's talk about our stuff. If we're living for the right kingdom, then every choice we make about our material possessions will be driven by our commitment to Christ. We are citizens of God's kingdom, and so we have this simple criterion to use in making decisions about what to spend. Is this something that I can buy? Is this a way that I can use my money that ultimately is for Christ and for his kingdom? And so rather than asking questions like, do I look good in this? Or would that be fun to do? We ask deeper questions like, how will having this affect relate my relationships inside and outside the body of Christ? Or questions like this, given the work of the kingdom worldwide, is this the best way? to use this money. Unless we're asking those kinds of questions, it will be very difficult, if not impossible, for us to exercise good stewardship. And it will be easy for us to be discontent. If those aren't the kinds of questions we're asking ourselves, then we will always want more and we will never be satisfied with what we have. I wonder if you've Learn this lesson in life, that the way to be content is not by getting more of what you think you want, but by knowing when to say enough is enough. Here's a very good question, a good way to test whether we're living for the kingdom of stuff, and that is to consider how often we say thank you to God. We've done it together corporately this morning in our morning prayers. Praise the Lord for that. Will we do it again Later today, will we do it when we go to the dining hall? And to, will we take a moment with our, alone by ourselves or with a friend to thank God for the privilege of eating this kind of food? Have you ever gone back to your dorm room or apartment or house and, and looked around and offered praise to God for the clothes you have, the books you have the privilege to read, your computer perhaps, your furniture, whatever else it is that you have there? Mark Buchanan writes about visiting a little village in Uganda the local congregation worshipped on a dirt floor under a tin roof in a lean-to on the edge of a cornfield. And one Sunday, the pastor asked if anyone had anything to share. One woman stood up and said, Oh, brothers and sisters, I love Jesus so much. Tell us, sister, tell us how much. Oh, I love him so much. I, don't even be I can't even begin to tell you how good he is. Start right there, the congregation said. Begin right there. Oh, he is so good to me. I praise him all the time for how good he is to me. For three months, I prayed to the Lord for shoes. And look. And she lifted up one leg and displayed what looked to Buchanan like a very ordinary shoe. He gave me shoes, she said. Hallelujah. He is so good. Buchanan sat there devastated. I sat there hollowed out, hammered down, he wrote. In all my life, I had not once prayed for shoes. And in all my life, I had not once thanked God for the many, many shoes that I have. You see, this is how using 
our stuff for the kingdom of God begins, receiving that stuff as a gift from God, which helps us remember that it is really for him and is to be used for his glory. Sex is the same, designed to work the same way. Take it for yourself, take it from others, and it may give you physical pleasure, but it will shrivel your soul. Sex is really about relationships. It is that covenant cement that God designed to unite one man and one woman in a love for relationship for life. I love what Wendell Berry said about this. He said, the reason God has given us marriage like this is to protect the possibility that sexual love can become a story. And that story is not just about us. Ultimately, it's about the mystery of sex points us to Christ and our romance with him. And seeking God's kingdom in our sexuality means saying, Lord Jesus, I want this part of my life to be what you want it to be, not what I want it to be. Sex is not outside my commitment to your kingdom, it's inside. And so I surrender my sexual thoughts and desires, even the sexual parts of my body to your sovereignty. Use them to bring me closer to you, not farther away. But why stop with our sexuality? Because if we're putting the kingdom first in everything, then why not offer him our very selves? That's really what it means to seek the kingdom of Christ. It is to surrender the kingdom of self. One man who understood this well was the famous evangelist John Wesley. And if we are wise, we will surrender our lives to Christ the way that he did. Let me invite you to close your eyes and bow your heads as I end with his prayer. I am no longer my own Lord, but yours. Put me to what you will. Rank me with whom you will. Put me to doing or put me to suffering. Let me be employed for you or laid aside for you, exalted for you or brought low for you. Let me be full or let me be empty. Let me have all things or let me have nothing. I freely and wholeheartedly yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. And Lord Jesus, we offer this prayer for the sake of your kingdom, in your name, amen. You are dismissed.